Welcome to the Secrets of the Bible channel, Revelation chapter 11 verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. Revelation 11 introduces two significant figures known as the two witnesses. Their role is primarily prophetic, indicated by their attire of sackcloth, which symbolizes repentance and they are empowered to carry out their ministry effectively. Historically, God has always had witnesses even in the darkest and most corrupt times. Notable examples include Noah, who preached righteousness for 120 years before the flood, Abraham in Canaan, Joseph in Egypt, the judges in Israel, such as Gideon during periods of Septuphion, Elijah, Ahab, and Jezebel, and Daniel in Babylon. This tradition continues to the present day with believers worldwide acting as witnesses. The 144, 000 from the tribes of Israel, as mentioned in Revelation chapter 7 verse 1 to 10, have taken up the mantle to spread the gospel globally. Revelation chapter 11 verse 3 then shifts focus to two additional unique witnesses. These two individuals are described as unparalleled in their dedication to preaching the gospel. While there are various theories about their identities, ranging from symbolic representations like the Law and the Prophets or the Old and New Testaments, to actual historical figures, the text does not explicitly name them. Common conjectures suggest that they might be Elijah and Moses or Enoch and Elijah. Due to their historical and scriptural significance, the debate over their identities is fueled by scriptural hints and religious tradition. For instance, Elijah is mentioned in Malachi chapter 4 verse 5 to 6 as returning before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he, along with Moses, appeared at Jesus' transfiguration, as recorded in Matthew chapter 17, verse 2-3. This appearance links them to pivotal moments in biblical narratives. Furthermore, both Moses and Elijah perform miracles similar to those described in Revelation 11, such as controlling the weather and raising plagues, which aligns with the actions of the two witnesses. Elijah's candidacy is bolstered by the fact that he was taken into heaven without dying, a rarity in scripture shared only with Enoch, making them figures of particular eschatological interest. The story of Michael the archangel disputing with the devil over Moses' body, mentioned in Jude, chapter 1, verse 9, also adds a layer of mystical significance to Moses' potential role as a witness. It's important to understand that we do not know who the two witnesses are. God has the ability to empower anyone with the necessary qualities. These witnesses could be any believers, individuals from the Bible, or entirely new beings created by God. God possesses resources and capabilities beyond our understanding, and only He knows the identities of these witnesses. Revelation chapter 11 verse 4 to 14. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth, and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues, as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they, of the people in kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them, that dwelt on the earth. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past. And behold, the third woe cometh quickly. This prophecy describes a period of global conflict during which a dictator, known as the Beast, will come to power. He will manipulate public opinion and use religious deception to strengthen his control, likely employing mass media as a powerful tool to achieve his goals. For a moment, let us focus on the ninth verse of Revelation 11. Revelation chapter 11 verse 9, which describes a moment when people from various nations and languages witness an event simultaneously seemed unimaginable two centuries ago. How could individuals from around the globe see the same event at the same time? Today, this scenario is entirely feasible due to advances in technology. Modern technology allows us to watch live events from anywhere in the world. Through television and digital devices like smartphones and tablets, people can follow happenings in real time, regardless of their geographical location. This capability aligns strikingly with the prophecy in Revelation 11, 9, where it is foretold that people from different people, kindreds, tongues, and nations will observe the dead bodies of the two witnesses for three and a half days. The fact that such a global viewing is possible today speaks to the accuracy of the biblical prophecy when this prophecy was written nearly two. Zero, zero, zero years ago, the technology we take for granted today, televisions, computers, smartphones, was unimaginable. 
the very notion of video calls or streaming live footage across the world would have been completely foreign and incomprehensible. This fulfillment is not just about technological advancements, it underscores the precision of prophetic scripture. It demonstrates how biblical prophecies can manifest in ways that are initially beyond human understanding, only to be clarified as society and technology evolve. Imagine explaining to someone two, zero, zero, zero years ago that in the future people would be able to see and communicate with each other. They live across vast distances via small handheld devices or screens in their homes. It would have seemed like a fantasy. Yet here we are today, witnessing events unfold in real time, just as described in Revelation, a testament to the prophetic accuracy of the scriptures. This example of the two witnesses viewed by the entire world is a powerful illustration of how prophecy transcends time, aligning ancient prophecy with modern capabilities. The two witnesses who are given the power to prophecy for one, 260 days, or roughly three and a half years, while wearing sackcloth, a symbol of mourning and repentance. These two witnesses are granted divine powers to protect themselves and to carry out their mission. They can shut the sky so that no rain falls during their period of prophecy, and they can turn water into blood and strike the earth with plagues whenever they wish. They are both protectors and proclaimers of God's message during a time of great tribulation. Eventually they are killed. In verse 9, the phrase peoples and tribes and tongues and nations suggests that people worldwide will observe the dead bodies of the Degen, witnesses likely through satellite television or other forms of visual media. In a grotesque display, the world will refuse to bury their bodies for three and a half days. This act of contempt will be celebrated by those who follow the Antichrist. Rejoicing in his apparent victory over the two prophets who had caused droughts and preached the unwelcome message of the gospel. This event will trigger widespread celebrations across the globe. People will rejoice, exchange gifts, and celebrate as if it were a holiday, displaying a profound hatred for the gospel. This reaction highlights a common misconception that a dramatic revelation of God would lead people to repent and follow him. However, as illustrated in Revelation, even when God's power is displayed unmistakably, many still choose to reject Him. This stubbornness is a stark portrayal of human hardness of heart, similar to what we see in today's world, where some react with hostility towards the gospel message. Ironically, this instance of rejoicing is the only one mentioned in the book of Revelation. People will be happy not because of a positive event, but because the prophets who confronted them with God's judgment demonstrated miraculous progress and called for repentance are no longer alive. This reaction vividly illustrates the depth of their rejection of God's message. Let's focus on the revival of the two witnesses. As the world watches, these witnesses suddenly stand up, striking fear into all who see them. Remember, the world had been watching and celebrating their deaths as their bodies lay in the streets. The shock of seeing them come to life would send shockwaves around the globe, particularly as the event is broadcasted by the media. The scripture notes, great fear fell on those who saw them, marking a stark contrast to the earlier joy at their death. The terror and astonishment that follow can be imagined as a mix of surprise, shock, and dismay. These emotions overwhelm the unbelievers just three and a half days after the beast kills the witnesses. In a scene reminiscent of God breathing life into Adam, God revives his witnesses, prompting them to stand, deemed too righteous for the world. God calls them to ascend to heaven in a cloud. Simultaneously, a great earthquake occurs, symbolizing judgment and prompting many to acknowledge God's power. However, it's uncertain if this recognition leads to genuine repentance and salvation. While the survivors of the earthquake give glory to God, this doesn't necessarily mean they worship or honor him in a true sense. They acknowledge his power but there's no clear indication of repentance. The world's response is one of awe and fear, acknowledging God's might through their reactions, but lacking a sincere commitment to honor Him. So, what are the things these witnesses will do? One, they will have the power to witness. We refer to them as the witnesses because they are uniquely empowered by God to testify. Witnessing is not a simple task. It requires divine support. These men will deliver sermons unlike any that have been heard before. You think of the most impactful sermon you've ever heard. It will pale in comparison to what these men will preach. I recall a preacher from my childhood in a small gospel town. His sermons on hell were so vivid that it felt as if the temperature in the church rose. Compelling the congregation to repent his ability to convey the reality of hellfire was unmatched similarly. These two witnesses will preach with a power and conviction never seen before their messages will be profound truths and for this reason they will be despised as stated in John 3 19 men love, darkness rather than light, indicating that truth often brings hostility from those who prefer to remain unenlightened. They will have ability to breathe fire from mouths. Secondly, the two witnesses possess the power to control the weather. This kind of power has previously been seen in the Bible with figures such as Elijah and Joshua. God granted Elijah the power to halt rain, while Joshua commanded the sun to stand still. 
Like them, these two witnesses can stop and start the rain at will. This demonstrates their control over the seasons, a formidable ability that makes them nearly invulnerable to harm. Why would God endow these witnesses with such power? They are tasked with affirming that Jesus is the Son of God, who died and was resurrected. To convince people of their divine mission, they must perform signs that go beyond mere magic tricks, like card tricks or vanishing acts, which might be dismissed with sleight of hand. Instead, their ability to command nature itself signifies a divine power akin to that of a creator. Revelation chapter 11 verse 6 states, These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. Emphasizing their extraordinary capabilities, thirdly, they have the power to strike the earth with plagues, a judgment reminiscent of God's actions in the Old Testament against the Egyptians when Pharaoh refused to free the Israelites. The witness's ability to bring plagues mirrors this divine intervention, contributing to why they are deeply resented and ultimately targeted for assassination. At the end of their mission, the world will capture and kill them, leading to widespread celebration. For over three years, these men were untouchable, and their deaths will be marked by people exchanging gifts, as noted in the biblical narrative. This rejoicing reflects the profound relief and triumph felt by those who opposed them, 